disappear. He says the body, after all, has evolved over generations and over and over centuries. It has evolved anthropologically. So Stellark in this performance, which he has never been able to do because he can't get a surgeon to do it, would like to get a third ear put on the side of his face. And everyone, even he broke up a relationship on account of his insistence on this. Because he says, really, a third ear would perform some very good functions. Why does it have to be on the side of your head? A third ear could be someplace else. So this is his third ear experiment. Or Stellark would do other experiments like the evolving URL body. If I can get it to come up. I don't want to, I don't want to go into the whole thing. But the evolving URL body is the body where Stellark puts his body literally on the internet, wires himself up, and then you can play the Stellark body by going on the internet anywhere in the world and his body will automatically respond because his muscle stimulators can be linked into the net to the commands that it's receiving. And for Stellark, it's like, you know, it's like uh, what a guy named McKinsey, I think, in Britain did where he had a chip put in to basically a chip put into his nervous system almost, implanted into his body. So that you had his like really like flesh machine became like really real. And Stellark's the same way. He says, well, what happens when the body becomes exteriorized when the body becomes like the internet body and can be played by the internet itself. And it seems like on the surface you start grisly and say, well, it's sort of silly, but when you think about it, everybody here has got that kind of body, I think. Who here, in terms of your autobiography, cannot say that you have not been played by television? Your emotions have not been played by television. This week we're going through like an orgy of sadness. You know, like an orgy of remembrance of 9-11, based on like a profound, authentic tragedy. But a year later, the media is getting up to like into fits of frenzy, saying, okay, it's time for the population to be resequenced. It's time for people's emotional buttons to be pressed. It's time to bring out like these profoundly sad stories. So who here in media, technology, and politics does not have our bodies played all the time and our emotions played? Who does not go to a cinema and if it's a good movie that you like, you don't find yourself like really sinking into it very deeply and it begins to register in your emotions. And have you ever had that effect where you're like you're in a cinema and you sort of walk out onto the street and it's almost like you're falling like down the gravity well, I felt like sometimes. But suddenly you're in street life and it's St. Catherine Street, you know, people are going by. But your mind is like back somewhere else, you know, it's like in another space. And it takes a bit of time to make that to kind of transition from cinema culture to street culture itself. So the stellar body and the kind of experiments they would do, and what other artists would do in terms of experiments, is really to begin to just to privilege, you know, to make very visible what is perhaps happening to our bodies as we move through you know, the, as we live within technological societies itself. So from time to time in this class, with your permission, I'd like just to show some examples of interesting artists around the world, interesting technological artists, because I think artists really are exactly what Marshall McLuhan said. Marshall McLuhan said a long time ago, he said, you know, artists are like, you know, they're the probes of technoculture. They're the people in many ways in a pioneering sense who go ahead and sort of probe our future. And so like an artist like Stellar, it's interesting. Class schedule now. The, uh, we'll just begin tonight with just a very general introduction to media, technology, and politics. And then for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about technology and politics with reference to specific texts within this book. And the class next week will really begin just with the introduction to the book, which is David Bill and Barbara Kennedy, pages 1 through pages 20. And, you know, Brad David Bell will talk about the virtual machine and new becomings, excuse me, he'll talk about cyber culture's reader. And Barbara Kennedy then has a really interesting thing about the virtual machine and she'll tell a story about a car accident that she was in, in which she wakes up and finds herself literally flesh and machine. She wakes up in an intensive care unit. Her body is wired and she is a person who thinks about issues of technology immediately begins to think, what space am I living in? Is this what flesh machine really means? Is this how the interface is going to come about? 
This is how we're going to transition to machines. An interesting introduction, and I like Barbara Kennedy's particularly because it's written in a much more fluid style. And then the um, second part of, you know, the second on part of the 18th, we'll then talk about, you know, what I just will call data flush, like data bodies. Like what does it really mean to have a data body and talk about perspectives like clashing perspectives on technology, talk about the ideology of information technology, wired culture and wired identity, visions of the global electronic city. And in the readings that we're going to take are really these, for my mind, but I'm prejudiced because I sort of like, I don't agree with these readings, but I just think they're really serious and good. Michael Benedict's article called Cyberspace First Steps, which I think is a really, really important read, and I hope you like it, because he says, he thinks of technology anthropologically. He says that, you know, if we're so seduced by technology, it's because it speaks to something so deeply mythological within ourselves. Or a much more skeptical vision, in some ways, Arturo Escobar, welcome to Siberia. Or a really skeptical perspective will be, that contrasts with this, will be Kevin Robbins, writing from Britain, cyberspace in the world we live in, and then if you like, uh, Mary Louise and myself wrote this book, Code Warriors, Bunkering In and Dumbing Down. It's not, it's the subtext of that is The Simpsons in some ways, as sort of like, you know, the representative citizens of technological culture, although it doesn't want to mention that. But it's about code warriors, what it means to really, you know, what kind of identities we have in technological culture. Then there are suggested readings. On September 25th, same book, We'll talk about politics and, and cyber culture, speed surfaces. And the focus will be on movies. You know, because I think the one point we'll make, like by next week, the point will be made that, like, well, like one of the real probes of, like one of the real, real kind of prophetic probes of what is happening to us technologically is oftentimes come to us very early in terms of cinema. People sort of go to the show, say, oh, an interesting show or not. And I say, well, that's true. But I say, well, let's, think of these movies appearing in a particular context. Let's think of like the meaning of the matrix. Why does the matrix appear? And what kind of visions of technology appear in the matrix? What about the Terminator and Blade Runner and Total Recall or other great movies like, you know, Memento? You know, what does that say about questions of identity? When you flip the camera, you click the camera and you have an identity for a moment and you have a memory for a moment. What does that say about the question of memory and technology? There's lots of other cinema that we'll be talking of. And this section of readings in part two and three, Forrest Pyle and Scott Buchanan and David Thomas and Alison Landsberg and Dean and Michael Weinstein will all be talking about prosthetic memory, about cinema. They <coughs> make the point over and over again. Do we in fact have very different forms of memory in contemporary culture? Do we have like one form of memory which for each of us is so singular and so precious? You know, memories of our relationships, memories of our families, people we love, or you know, relationships that are broken up, things that have happened to our life. You know, like the path of your own individual autobiography in, in life. But on the other hand, do we have other memories? Do we have other memory implants that have happened by way of television and cinema and the net? Other kind of memory traces which begin to get confused with our own memories. Is a movie like artificial, like AI, simply a movie? Or is it maybe prophetic of like artificial life of artificial memories and a life of artificial intelligence? I mean, AI begins with that, you know, really profound question. Can the love of a robot child ever be really reciprocated by a mother? So that was really profound at the beginning of that movie. Can in fact, you can have no, the course that robots can be programmed to love human beings. But can a human being, a mother, reciprocate with that love with a machine, with artificial intelligence itself? In which a movie is really interesting for me because it's in part because it really reflects on what is the meaning of this new kind of relationship between ourselves and machines, artificial intelligence and robots that's happening. What does it mean really in terms of identity? What does it mean in terms of um, human emotions? So that'll be on September 25th, in which you really just part that, start that discussion. October the 2nd, I'd like to show a video 
which is a video about After Darwin. It's done by a Montreal film company, uh, Gela Films, and After Darwin's a really, really profound piece of cinema because it really says, well, the, one of the forms of technology that we live in is, in fact, we're living in the age of biotechnology and molecular genetics and genetic screening. And what are the political and cultural ramifications of our commitment to this new kind of genetic future, the Human Genome Project? So I thought, well, rather than just read about that, why don't we bring in you know, the, a skillful, the product of a skillful filmmaker that thinks about this. October 9th, we will begin the discussion, I really just mean begin the discussion, of cyber feminism. And look particularly at the writings of the really famous article by Donna Haraway called A Cyborg Manifesto, Science, Technology, and Socialist Feminism in the Late 20th Century. And then an article by Sadie Plant on The Matrix, who is a very opposite perspective from Donna Haraway's Sadie Plant on The Matrix, Cyber Feminist Simulations, two really contrasting feminist perspectives. Midterm exam, the 23rd will be uh, cyber, uh, the beginnings of a discussion on cyber sex in which we'll, from the perspective of you know, really interesting writers like Randall Woodland who talks about queer spaces and gay and lesbian identities and Sadie Plant coming across the future and Nina Wakeford talking about cyber queer, we'll talk about a series of perspectives on cyber sexuality on cybernauts and cyberqueer, on what happens to gay and lesbian and transsexual relationships and to whole questions of sexual difference in internet culture itself. And these articles, you know, seriously and creatively written from queer perspectives, from gay and lesbian and transsexual perspectives, really try to put the question. And they're not finished pieces by any means. They're just tentative explorations written at a particular point in time. And I think as we have classroom discussion, in fact, we'll come sort of close, closer to finalizing them. On October 30th, going to the readings once more, we'll talk about cyber colonization, you know, which is like, do we live really in McLuhan's utopia of a global village? Or has the future that technology has delivered us to, is it a future of simply very traditional forms of colonization and colonialism? masked and dressed up to in kind of tech glitzy terms itself. And very interesting articles by Graham Barwell and Kate Bowles, Border Crossings, the Internet and the Dislocation of Identity, or Lisa Nakamura, who says race in for cyberspace, and she talks about identity tourism and racial passing, or John Stratton, Cyberspace and the Globalization of Culture. And again, when we talk about cyber colonization, it'll just be the beginning of a talk you know, of a discussion in cyber colonization, interesting topic if you're, you know, of interest in this direction to then proceed to maybe write a paper in that area. November 6, cyber bodies, in which we'll talk about wired bodies and disappearing boundaries between human bodies and machinic culture. What does it mean to live in electronically overexposed cities? Interesting perspectives like Deborah Lupton, the embodied computer user, and Balsamo, the virtual body in cyberspace, or uh, Sandy Alicari or Zion Stone, Sandy Stone. Will the real body please stand up? Boundary stories about virtual cultures. And have some examples. And then the last two, uh, two or three classes then, we'll just talk about you know, different political cultural perspectives on technological society. Like questions of scaling cyberspace. In other words, are digital, what is the meaning of digital communities? You know, we can think of like communities, of face-to-face -face communities. Do digital communities exist and how do they exist on the net? What is the meaning of, do we live in a globalized culture or do we live in the culture of the disappearance of local or something else? And just be three articles or four articles that I just point to in the book that really deal with these uh, topics on what's the meaning of new digital communities. It's a really serious discussion because it's intended to raise two points at least. One, can you have authentic net communities? You know, are net communities as authentic as face-to-face -face local communities? When you have net communities, then what is their impact? A friend of mine is doing a book right now called Insurgent Politics. He used to teach at Concordia, now he's teaching at, in New Brunswick. Insurgent Politics, his research is fantastic because he's going around politically 
and really from a point of view saying, well, for those who are like exist in local situations, like in uh, Afghanistan or Palestine or other countries where you're really shut out of official voices of power in your minority cultures, like say be before uh, the war in Afghanistan, he had tracked you know, the um, feminist sites that were coming out of, uh, of Pakistan from the border with Afghanistan revolutionary women's movement of Afghanistan and was tracking and showing me the video that they were sneaking out. Like the video where people were going to the sports facilities, the sports stadiums. And the women of course wore the, you know, the guard, the complete covering guard, but they also at that time would take many women were taking small cameras in with them, hidden away. And they were these grisly shots of, you know, women being dragged out into the middle of the stadium, guns being put to their head and they would be shot. And they would then s smuggle the film out and then the revolutionary women's uh, movement of Afghanistan would then put it up on the internet. And you know, really creates a consciousness of your outside consciousness of solidarity and sadness and the kind of intimacy of politics and has like real effects in that community. Now his book on insurgent politics, it just you know like in terms of like really just ground research is really going around to site after site and the movement after movement and showing that one real impact of the internet has been the development of insurgent politics. Like the Zapatistas in Mexico, right? Who first, you know, make their claim, you know, that free trade agreements are signed and NAFTA comes into existence and bamo, the Zapatistas strike and say, you know, we are rebelling as, you know, indigenous peoples of Mexico. We are rebelling, we are demanding to be known and this treaty really hurts our indigenous rights itself and here's why. And then like pre-internet times in which you can't get information about the Zapatistas and the state can deal with them as they want, they did the very smart thing. They developed a website immediately in a net site and had immediately a global community of other people in solidarity with them. Said, so, well, what's the Zapatistas saying? And what is the relationship between a local indigenous struggle of indigenous peoples in Mexico and this transnational critique that they're making. Well, increasingly in net politics, there's this deep relationship developing between you know, the experience of politics in our own local situations and simply the telegraphing of the politics to a much wider community on the internet itself. I mean, would the anti-globalization movement really be possible without the internet, without the high speed communications, without a lot of young people and students having like really great digital facilities and skills, being able to communicate and use the internet creatively, share and exchange information. If you're a political scientist, it's a golden age to do political research because you can just find out so many things that are going on. Like, you know, what is this? We know the official story of 9 11, but what are the unofficial stories of 9 11? What rumors are going on? You know, what stories never are allowed to make it to the official press? If you're a student in Concordia and in Montreal, you know, traditionally we would have been closed to that. It'd be very hard to find the sources. But well, just go to Google, which I take as like the Delphic Oracle of the Times, press in the topic that you want, and then just use reason judgment. You know, sift through events and see how you can how things coordinate, make up your own mind and events itself. It just strikes me that this section on scaling cyberspaces, on net politics, is just like so significant and just, I think it's just radically transforming the basis for, you know, political thought. On November 20th, virtual DJ, spatial music and visual art, in which we're gonna bring a performer into class. It's going to do a class together with the digital design group at Concordia University and a really great musician's coming in, Steve Gibson, who teaches in the visual arts department at the University of Victoria, but he's also a composer. And he's done this great piece called Virtual DJ. In a virtual DJ, you would take like a room like this, except we can't use this room because the benches are all, you can't move them too easily. You need like a square room, so we're gonna find another room. And he's got like uh, sensors, kind of sonar sensors that we used in submarines basically. So they'd be put in the four corners. And then when you hook them up to the computer, basically what it does is that it creates invisibly and X, Y creates an algorithmic space, you know, a wired space in the room, which has an X, Y axis. And then that Y, X, Y axis is coded with music. You sample every, every micro millimeter part of that, 
has a different register of music. And then you put on the sensors, if you like, and you can get up and you can begin to dance to the music. And suddenly, in fact, the music begins to play your body. If you get up and dance with someone else, you can do suddenly do these really interesting things. If you both have sensors, you can actually reach over and you can steal someone's sound. You can actually steal sound, you know? And you can begin then to do, you are your own DJ. You are your own performer. And it radically changes the, relate, the notion of a performer. It certainly changes the notion of who's the composer because suddenly you become the composer of the music. And the music that you compose is then combined with a kind of light show that is also registered. You know, it's like a sampler light show that's triggered by the motions that you are making. So I thought it would be interesting in this class to sort of just go interactive and see how this kind of works in sort of a creative way. So with your family, does that sound interesting? It should be, yeah. And Steve's a really nice guy. He's a really deeply accomplished composer. And he's really at the cutting edge. He's a young guy, for myself, I would say he's a young guy. He's, uh, but he's like at the cutting, a young professor, and he's at the cutting edge of new media music. And this virtual DJ is a, I think, there's a good chance I would think of winning major awards in the world. You know, it's just, just finished. And it's just, you know, it's one of those kind of really interesting technologies. And then on 27th, on November 27th, we'll talk about post-cyber bodies, designing new bodies for the cybernetic future, the memory of the body, and the split body, and talk about things like aging, and illness, and health. And what do these things mean to this notion of the technological body which is never supposed to die? What happens, in fact, to traditional questions of death in cyber culture? And Stellark will ask, well, why do we have to bother dying anymore? You can continue to live electronically. So this whole class then is a class you know, from different points of view and as general, you know, keeping the terms as general as possible because I know people are coming here from you know, many different perspectives and focusing on the readings each week just to creatively open up the question of media technology and politics and to uh, do a bit of writing on your part and do as much as possible thinking within the context of the class. Does that sound doable? I think it's doable anyway. So the book that we're using is The Cyber Cultures Reader. And it may be that, you know, and we'll just make a decision after next week that if there's any point where the readings, there's too many readings, then I'll just cut down the readings. So make it reasonable, because I'd rather really have you read a fewer articles seriously, and then we can just have a reflection and discussion of that in class as opposed to trying to race through the readings. Okay, So it's not intended to be uh, onerous. It's intended to be a class that you can sort of enjoy and just sort of think about some interesting questions. Uh, any questions or comments? No. Yes? I think it is, yeah. yeah. And we're filming about the uh, film of the class can be used for two purposes. Is the, uh, we'll put up film, if we can do it, we're going to put up film of the class on a website about after, but it'll take about a couple of weeks or two or three weeks to get up. So it can be used as a supplement to the class. You can go back and sort of review the class. Okay. 48 hours. 48 hours. Yeah. Technology. <laughs> well, that's pretty fast, actually. OK. And uh, secondly, this class is going to be done electronically. And we're still trying to work out the protocols of how do you do a class electronically. Because I am going to, yeah, you don't. Yeah, well. Because I've really been interested in the notion of electronic education, and I am completely ambivalent about it. I thought, well, the only way of really thinking about this deeply is do a course electronically and see if you can teach in this medium. But I'm going to introduce some other readings on this class. The CAUT, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, just came out with a great book called The Corporate Campus. Really, really great book. And it's got a whole series of perspectives that are very critical of electronic education. And so what I like to do is to have those in class and so, and really talk about, as part of this class, what does electronic education mean? Whose purposes does it serve? And does it com completely undermine educational, the educational imagination as we know it? Or are there possibilities of using digital education to, in fact, enhance imagination, which I hope. Okay, but I think, well, the bare minimum of that is going to be making those discussions very visible. Okay, so any questions? Yeah, I put two classes, but I think in one of those I'm going to leave it like a class space so that 
in case anxiety you can't get you can have space and that class period will be turned over during the midterm okay but the other space because I think we'll probably get behind in the reading so we'll have to use that space for a class I think okay but I left the first space free just because I'm trying to allow you to do some writing but at the end of to have space for writing and at the same time you don't have to like race through readings for that week and you can really just focus on that assignment and stuff okay is fair enough yes uh, maybe I should know that, but I don't, because I bought my book last year. Uh, you can get secondhand copies of this book for sure. That's what you should, because this I used this book last year. So there's got to be secondhand copies floating around, but there's new copies in the bookstore. It's okay. Yeah, so there you are. Forty-four dollars. Well, it's two CDs, I think, really. CDs, though, it's a hard choice. But you can also get the book. This book, though, I would say this is as a, um, don't usually use textbook, but this textbook I just thought was really good because it wasn't the ordinary thing written by a single author. It has a huge variety of perspectives on it, and the articles in it are just really classic articles. So it's the book's at the bookstore, or if you ask, you can buy the book secondhand. So there's got to be copies floating around. Okay? See you next week.